Talk Show. Recorded live. Hello, this is Michael Adams from Nothing But the Truth. It's January the 14th, 2015. Uh, once again, we have uh, another episode of a conversation with Juggler 66, and Jorg is with us along with uh, Tom Fress. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to read a couple of the headlines from Yahoo.com. Headline number one, Pope visits Buddhist temple, sees relics in rare honor. Associated Press, uh, Colombo, uh, Sri Lanka, AP, Pope Francis became the second pope to visit the Buddhist temple on Wednesday, changing his schedule at the last minute to pay his respects at an important place of worship. <clears throat> okay. Let's see, decide what you think about that one. Um, Pope Francis demotes conservative American cardinal who opposes ch- church reform. And this is the Inquisitor. Pope Francis has demoted conservative American cardinal Raymond Lee Burke, in a move that was not at all that unexpected. And uh, let's see, maybe a couple more here. Kansas City Catholics divided over Vatican's investigation of Bishop, uh, npr.org. Robert Finn, head of the Kansas City Diocese, is the only U.S. Bishop convicted of shielding a sexual abusive priest. Again, you can read more of that if you want on Yahoo.com. Uh, Associated Press: Pope's Filipino host is a humble rising church star. Manila, Philippines AP: Pope Francis will be welcomed. Um, in this Catholic heartland. I don't know if you knew that. <clears throat> on Thursday by Filipino Cardinal. And you can read more about that once again on Yahoo.com. And another one, Warders. In Catholic Philippines, uh, Father Priests Seek Papal Blessings by Eric D. Castro, Lambanio, Philippines, Warders. Um, every Sunday morning, dozens of Roman Catholics gather at a small chapel on an island in the central of the Philippines to listen to Father Jess Siva share his personal, etc. And uh, an awful lot of articles this this morning about uh, Pope's visit to Sri Lanka, and it should keep us conscious of the fact that the Pope will be here in the United States. Uh, addressing both branches of our federal government and, along, and also visiting the, uh, Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia and New York City, and who knows who else is going to visit. Um, <clears throat> this should be quite concerning to anybody, I feel, seeing how there's so much news about a particular man and a particular organization. So with that, gentlemen, I will now invite you both in to the show. Um, Jorg, how are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you very much. I was so much looking forward to have this uh, next broadcast on the characteristics on the Antichrist, so I'm eager to start. But uh, yeah. and Tom, Tom, how are you doing? Yes, doing fine, and uh, equally anxious to continue uh, discussing the characteristics of Antichrist, about whom you just spoke, <laughs> the papacy. The yes. papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible, and that's why Yahoo.com focuses all of its attention on the papacy, the head of the global counterfeit religion of Christ. The New World Order is well-seated, and it's up and running, and uh, where is the protest? That's the question I should ask. Where is the protest? That's the question. The question of where is the protest brings us uh, right back to this uh, congregation that uh, Kenneth Copeland had with uh, his bishop, Tony Palmer, where they exchanged the videos about, uh, with uh, Pope Francis at that time, when um, Tony Palmer stated, uh, Luther's protest is over, is yours. 
um, that brings brings us right back to where yeah. That was a very interesting video for the people who saw it. What page are we on, Jörg? Well, um, in the PDF, we are on page 66. Uh, we are starting with uh, characteristic number 18 of the Antichrist, that uh, the Antichrist is a world power which the world wanders after. So that's in the PDF number, uh, page 66, and in the document, page 60. Oh, thank you. Okay, I will start reading there, and it starts with a quote from Revelation, uh, chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. Quote, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? End quote. All throughout history, the Roman Catholic Church has appealed to the masses merely because sin is appealing to the lost. Most will say that Rome must be, true, must be the true church because of its immense size. But looking to scripture, one can see that size is a true giveaway that is evil. Case in point, all the world thought, uh, thought Noah and his family were nuts. Only eight people on the planet were walking with God at that time. As always, the majority is most likely to be those that are friends with the world. Whenever the President of the United States would travel abroad, there would be upwards of, uh, of a thousand or more journalists covering his every move. During an election, one can expect that number to double. During wartime, it would triple. Now look at the Pope. No matter what the occasion is, there is always a minimum of 15,000 journalists covering his every move. If the Pope so much as stubs his toe, people <clears throat> the world over will hear about it. All the world truly does wonder after this beast. The word wandered in the verse uh, 3 of Revelation 13 is translated by Strong's Concordance in this way. It means marvel, wonder, have an admiration, admire, marveled, or to wonder, to wonder at. Every popular magazine on earth has either openly stated the Pope an admirable man or a holy man of God. Time magazine, back in May of 1981, actually said, quote, it's like shooting God when the Pope was shot. Quote, shooting presidents, that's politics, that I can understand. But shooting the Pope, it's like shooting God, end quote. Time magazine, May 25th, 1981, in the article, It's Like Shooting a God by George J. Church. Well, what a name for that journalist, right? It's bad enough for a man to believe that shooting another man is like shooting God, but to have a brazen disrespect for the lives of presidents who are assassinated merely because of their occupation is troubling to say the least. A simple fact to notice is this. If the Pope were God, as he claims to be in dozens upon dozens of authenticated Vatican quotes, then why, I ask, has it never been recorded in any history book whatsoever of a Pope raising a dead man or healing a blind man a deaf man, a leper, or a cripple. How about a simple miracle as easy as healing himself? How many popes have died since the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church? I thought they said they were God. Why is it they keep dying? And why is it, uh, <clears throat> is it no one notices? In fact, why is it everyone missed it when Pope John, Paul II, uh, Pope John Paul himself was unable to cast a demon out of a 19-year-old girl uh, not long ago during Vatican Mass. So now we, just, uh, we read from the Vatican Exor Exorcism Fails. Um, that's an article from a staff writer of uh, Sally Sadok. Um, in September 12, 2000, a British newspaper has reported an unusual encounter with the devil in the Vatican, with Pope Paul II himself attempting an exorcism of a possessed young woman. The Telegraph reported the Pope carried out an impromptu exorcism on a teenage girl after she began screaming insults in a cavernous voice during the audience in the Vatican City. Despite the Pope's efforts and those of his chief Satan buster, uh, Frere Gabriel Amors, the girl remained possessed. The devil's voice sneeringly laughed from within her, 
at the Pope's failed attempt to drive him away, said the British news organization. This was made known globally. Still, Catholics stayed in this church. Their wonderment of this man in robes has them hypnotized. Adam Clark put it best regarding the popes when he said, quote, They have assumed infallibility, which belongs only to God. They profess to forgive sins, which belongs only to God. They profess to open and shut heaven, which belongs only to God. They profess to be a higher and to be higher than all the kings of the earth, which belongs only to God. And they go beyond God in pretending to lose whole nations from their oath of allegiance to their kings, when such kings do not please them. And they go against God when they give indulgences for sin. This is the worst of all blasphemies. This is taken from Adam Clark commentary on Daniel uh, 7, verse 25. Even with all the obvious evils of this church, they still sport over one billion members worldwide. And all the mainstream media outlets wonder after him as their God by calling him Holy Father. Antichrist must have, must have all in agreement, either by choice in the forehead or by force in the right hand. Or his plans for global control will not work. The easy part, of course, is to get the masses in agreement that the Pope is a moral man. People are easy to manipulate in mass numbers a lot easier than one, and one, uh, than one on one. This is all regardless of the fact that not, 30 of, uh, that not 30 or 40 years ago, all Protestant religions openly proclaimed him Antichrist. Today, none do. For those that don't quit they don't quit believe that all Protestant churches called him Antichrist. I suggest surfing to my page entitled They Called Him Antichrist in the index in the prophecy section of the menu. In there, I have quotes from most mainline denominations declaring the popes of Rome to be Antichrist. The encyclical of Pope Pius X, issued in 1864, asserted the right to require the state not to leave any man free to profess his own religion the right to employ force, the right to claim dominion in temporal things, the right to have the entire control of public schools, the right to hold princes and kings in subjection, the right to treat all marriages as invalid, which are not solemnized according to the forms of the Council of Trent, the right to prevent the state granting to immigrants the public exercise of their own worship, the right to require the state not to permit free expression of opinion. Every single move of the Pope is televised on a global scale as a blanket over every eye on earth. Every church on the planet has absolute evidence that they have allowed the Roman Catholic Church to tell them how to worship in one way or another. The United States Internal Revenue Service has also bowed to the suggestions of, his Latin, uh, of this Latin-speaking man. Every man, woman, and child is affected in one way or another by the actions of the Vatican and Rome, whether in a spiritual or in a physical sense, or both. Every nation on earth must have friendly relations with the Vatican in order to assure her friends do not remove them from the face of the earth. Truly, all nations declare, quote, who is able to make war with them, unquote, as prophecy stated they would. Every Protestant church that in the past has openly declared the Pope as Antichrist has now come forward in these last days to declare a change of mind. Every quote-unquote popular religious leader on earth, regardless of the fact that they profess Jesus as Lord or not, have all declared the Pope a quote-unquote holy man. Numerous strange laws found in the, book of every nation, in the books of every nation on earth have been first suggested by Rome. And now every church, regardless of its proclamation of faith, Christian or non-Christian, are now filling the pews with the Pope's newly created One World Church. Has all the world wandered after this beast? Indeed, they have. For even the churches themselves have proclaimed their allegiance to this man. Churches agree that the Pope has overall authority. The Pope was recognized as the overall authority in the Christian world by an Anglican and Roman Catholic commission yesterday, 
which described him as, quote, um, a gift to be received by all the churches, unquote. If a new united Christian church was created, it would be the Bishop of Rome who would exercise a universal premacy. The 43-page document, The Gift of Authority, has been produced by the 18-member Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission after five years of debate. The commission concluded that the Bishop of Rome had a, quote, specific ministry concerning the discernment of truth, unquote, and accepted that only the Pope had the moral authority to unite the various Christian denominations. Mark Birchall, a member of the Church of England Evangelical Council, said, quote, it speaks as if the Bishop of Rome has always been on the side of the angels, while it is well known for that several centuries past the Bishop of Rome was certainly not, unquote. The R.T. Reverend Cormac Murphy O'Connor, Bishop of Arundel and Brighton, in the, uh, uh, and the other co-chairman added, quote, the primacy of the Pope is a gift to be shared, unquote. And these quotes are taken from the Electronic Telegraph in the UK News, May 13th, 1999. Let me share just one more article that quite graphically proves all the world wonders after this beast in Rome. There was a meeting called back in June of 1999 where all the powers that be were asked to come together on June 3 to June 6 to discuss something those of us that study prophecy knew was inevitable. Clinton, Pope joined Bilderberger's secret meeting of global movers, shakers in Portugal. That article comes from 1999 from worldnetdaily.com. What do Steven Spielberg, Pope John Paul II, Ted Turner, Boris Yeltsin, Bill Clinton and House Speaker Dennis Hastert have in common? They are among those on a partial guest list of expected attendees to the 1999 Bilderberg meeting in Portugal scheduled for next week. The secret meeting in Sintra, Portugal, takes place June 3rd to 6th. According to, <coughs> according to sources which have penetrated the high security meetings in the past, the Bilderberg meetings emphasize a globalist agenda and promote the idea that the notion of national sovereignty is antiquated and regressive. End quote from this reading. Can you guess what they're up to? Can you guess why the Pope was there? The only religious leader attending? Have you ever seen this? Uh, have you ever seen who is on the list? It appears every base is covered. Besides the obvious heads of state from all over the world that attended the global meeting, there's just a few that I found on the list to be a bit strange. What are these guys doing in a global meeting such as this? where Clinton and the Pope there to assure their global desires are understood by all people of the world? Indeed. Look at the names on that partial list. Look at some of the companies that were present there. It appears our daily lives were discussed, eh? It also appears our everyday lives are about to be altered in a way that can only confirm that the mark of the beast is about to be enforced. Why else would all these companies be present Think about it. The Bible says you will not be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Now think about all these companies being in agreement with the Pope or wandering after him. Now think about the Pope insisting that anyone that does not agree with his doctrines will be prevented from buying or selling anything from these affiliated companies. And then realize that the power to enforce his desires are found in the one world court system already set up in Rome. And also keep in mind that he thinks he has no one to answer but for himself. Now, it follows a uh, copy, a partial copy of the list of the attendees of the Bilderberg meeting, and I'm not going to go through that. So we can maybe later on discuss the one or the other name. I mean, you see people like uh, Bill Gates that spring into mind. Um, uh, a lot of other interesting names I, I, I think are in here, but I will not go into the list, but, you know, we posted um, <clears throat> the link to this article uh, in, the, uh, in the website, so in, in, in the description of the website, and you can look that up for yourselves and read all two names through it. And you can even go to the page of the Bilderbergers, because I think on their own website 
um, there are some of the older attendees lists uh, being published in there. Rupert Murdoch is some other one I, I fall through here. And of course, um, the last the last one is quite interesting, Yehoshua A.B., an Israeli writer. That concludes the list of the Bilderberg meeting. And all the world truly wonders after this beast, and all truly know that no one is like this beast, nor can anyone make war with him. This prophecy is most assuredly fulfilled in the Vatican of Rome in Italy. Read my June 6, 1999 newsletter on global universal power of the Pope for many additional facts on this. And this ends the reading of characteristic number 18 of the Antichrist. So now I would like to invite Tom and Michael to share their views on what I just read and that we go a little bit deeper into this worshipping and falling down, bowing down to the Pope and that the whole world agrees with the Pope and his teaching, the Antichrist teaching, of course. But we surely have to forget, or not to forget, that we are talking about the rulers and the shakers of the nations. And we do not speak for everyone in them. We know, as we are gathered here together and do this broadcast, that in every country there is a small remnant that will refuse the mark of the beast, that refuses to wander after the beast, and that does not accept his authority that he was given by the dragon. Okay, Tom? Well, I, I would like to uh, kind of broaden the scope of the word wonder. All the world wonders after the beast. Uh, Yerk, you and I and Michael are at least coming to grips with the comprehension that the beast spoken of here is the papacy. He's the global king of kings and lord of lords. He's replaced Christ on the earth. That was his agenda from the very beginning. The vicar of Christ literally means the replacement of Christ on the earth. And, and what this means is, is not only the people who affirm the papacy as the supreme religious leader of the world, but we have to also understand that the Vatican is both a church and a state. And that in, other, in, in order to be obedient to this, to this antichrist power, uh, we not only are expected to assent to him as the religious wor- leader of the world, but the civil leader of the world. And that's why the kings of the earth give their power and strength unto the beast, because uh, they must obey him. The kings of the earth, that is the governments of the world, must obey him. And they do. They did in the old world order during the dark ages, and they do likewise today. And even for those of us who understand what role the papacy plays in the world and are in protest against him, we too are made to wander after the beast because the civil laws of this land, in whatever area of law that you wish to discuss, every law of this land is made to conform every citizen in this country to Roman Catholic canon law. That's right. The laws of this land must be and are being consistent with Roman Catholic canon law. And whether we like it or not, we're all coerced to wonder after the beast. You cannot buy and sell. I'll give you an example. It wasn't long ago. We were forced out of our house and uh, 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 and had to buy a house. And uh, it came time to sign the papers. And the woman, the realtor, asked me, uh, now I need your Social Security number. Why well, said, I'm not going to give you my Social Security number. And she, that kind of stopped her in her tracks. And... Uh, she kind of made light of it and changed the subject. And But there was this paper in front of her that required our Social Security number. And uh, suddenly she came back to it. Now, I, you know, for us to continue, I need, I, need to, uh, I need to have your Social Security number. I said, you don't understand. I'm not going to give you my Social Security number. The Social Security number was never intended to be an identification or anything other 
then uh, a private number and uh, uh, my social security number should have nothing whatsoever to do with this transaction. And she tried to make light of it again, and she realized that she had to force the issue. And she finally, when she realized that I was serious, I was, I was not going to give her my social security number. She looked me right in the eye, and she said, Tom, you can't buy a house without a social security number. Now, mind you, she was a Bible teacher. She held private Bible studies in her house. And I looked her right square in the eye, and I said, this is the mark of the beast. Now, I've since learned that there are many marks of the beast. Any attachment that we have, any legal or otherwise attachment that we have to this government is the mark of the papacy upon us because the civil laws of this land are there to make us conform to his spiritual and temporal power. The two keys of the Pope, the, the, the golden key represents his spiritual power over the churches, and the silver key represents his temporal power over the kings and the governments of the world. And here at the time that we are waking up for the first time in our lives to what the scriptures are really talking about, now that we know that both the scripture and history reveals the papacy to be the biblical, historical, and pro the prophetic antichrist of the scriptures. Only now are we beginning to understand what control he has over every aspect of our lives through the civil laws of our land. And truly, the whole world, including you and me and everybody else, are made to wonder after the beast. We are forced to wonder after the beast. And there's only one escape. There's only one. We simply have to cut our ties, all of them, with this beast system. And for those who might be recoiling right now, so this is just too much, they've gone too far, this just doesn't make sense. I invite you all to watch a video on YouTube entitled Vatican Control Through Civil Law. Vatican Control Through Civil Law. The, uh, the uh, subject of the video, the man doing the lecture uh, for 22 years, was a Rome, an Irish Roman Catholic priest. His name is Richard Bennett. He was a Vatican insider for 22 years of his life. He knows whereof he speaks. And he exposes in that video just exactly how every single one of us, the witting and the unwitting alike, have been made, have been forced to wonder after the beast. Everything we do is, is uh, the way we do our banking, the way we do our business, the way we do our buying, the way we do our selling, uh, the whole economic structure, the whole education structure, the churches, the government, everything is designed to comply with Roman Catholic canon law. We are literally living in a global Catholic society. And speaking specifically of the United States of America in a nation which has never uh, uh, said a word against the Jesuits. Now, the Jesuits were kicked out of virtually every country in which they ever operated, except the United States of America. The Jesuits have been welcome in this country to build the biggest and the best, the most prestigious uh, universities in the world, and to cultivate the intellectual crop of this nation to Jesuitize them in their political and religious views and then send them to Washington, D.C. and the state houses of this country into the universities and even the churches to implement this, this, uh, this Roman system that has bound us all, whether we're willing to admit it or not, every one of us carries the proof of the binding of our souls 
to the papacy in our hip pockets. And uh, it's a hideous reality. I don't want to overuse the term, but it is a hideous reality, what they've done to us. Literally, the whole world wonders after the beast. And this is even borne out in Scripture. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, it says, And he, speaking of the papacy, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Can I interrupt you for a second? Yes, certainly. What you are just saying that uh, doesn't end to all the discussion, whether the RFID coming microchip or even the first Sunday law are the mark of the beast. You are saying that we actually all already having the mark of the beast without even knowing and understanding it, right? That's the way I see it, and that's why they're making so much out of this RFID chip, I concur. which no one is inclined to take because they've, they've hyped it up as the mark of the beast, but we've, we've been given the mark uh, at least as, as, as far back as I believe it was the, 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 the 14th Amendment to the Constitution after the Civil War. 1868, yeah. Yeah, the 13th and 14th of Amendments of the United States did away with state citizenship and made us all citizens of the U.S. government. Washington, D.C., the, the, the third of the triumvirate, Rome, London, and Washington. And, and although we may claim to have citizenship in the states in which we live, and we may, con we may claim right to the, con the liberties of the Constitution that formed the states, that was all done away with pr uh, pr uh, prior to it, during, and after the Civil War. And now we're all literally citizens to Washington, D.C. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sovereign city-state that claims jurisdiction over every person in this country. And I use that term, I use that term person in the legal sense. That when you become a citizen of that of that of the of of uh, uh, Washington D.C., the District of Columbia, <clears throat> which every United States citizen is, you give up your sovereignty. You are enslaved at that point. You become you become an asset of that corporation, and they can do with you whatever they want. And if they want to attach to you bondage like licenses for marriage, like birth certificates, like social security numbers. All of these things are forbidden of the Lord. <clears throat> and yet we were born into it. We were literally born into it. As soon as our mothers took us to a hospital and then, and then, and then signed our certificate of birth and then received a birth certificate from the hospital, which is nothing but a receipt, without knowing she literally made her child a ward of the state, a citizen of the United States of America, that is, a citizen of Washington, D.C. And that, just, that makes you, that marks you from the very beginning. And then you compound that every time you get a license, a license to marriage, a license to drive a car, a license to do business, a, li uh, a tax license, uh, you, when you file an IRS uh, 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 tax return, every one of these things enforces the binding that the beast has upon all of us. So when the Bible says the whole world wonders after the beast, it literally means the whole world. And what few places there are in the world that don't yet have this system in place, I can tell you from a most authoritative source, that those are the nations in the world that don't have a Federal Reserve system, and those are the nations against which the United States is warring to implement this Roman system. That's the whole function of the United States of America, is to conquer those recalcitrant lands and force upon them 
a Federal Reserve Bank, and then, then the Vatican has a financial hold on the economy of that nation, and they forcibly then make the laws com- uh, commensurate with Roman Catholic canon law. Now, I know there were some comments, but I've, I've, uh, I think I've, I've described it at least enough to uh, incite further discussion. I think Michael had a comment. I do. I've, I would like to concur with what you're saying, Tom. I have felt for a very long time now that we've, at least in the United States of America and all countries similar to us that are run the same way, under the same organizations, uh, have been under the beast since the birth, since our birth. And you have just explained it in detail how that it goes about. But then it goes back to this whole thing. Uh, you know, we look at the... Say, well, some day Adventists, I don't want to pick on them particularly, except to say that, you know, we hear over and over again is the Sunday. Sunday law is coming, Sunday law is coming. That's the mark of the beast. And I would argue that that's, whether deliberately or intentionally or not, they have been manipulated in part of this whole futuristic deception. People waiting and waiting for the mark of the beast to happen when it's already happened to and I would you say the majority of, say, the United States of America and the citizenship or citizenry, um, we're talking 99.9999% of us. And that's the brutal, brutal reality of it. And that the, the shame in all this is that nobody, none of our religious leaders are pointing this out. None of our political leaders are pointing this out. Nobody's pointing this out. You know, it's really quite devastating when you realize how deceived we all have now you can say it's the united states you say it's the eu you can say you know uh, the majority of the world has to operate under some kind of id system doesn't have to be a chip doesn't have to be sunday law you just have to sign your rights and your over to the to the state controlled by the rome itself so um I know it's a hard pill to swallow for most people to accept, and it's taken me a long time myself to accept it, too. It took me about a year of bashing it over in my head and studying it and researching to realize, yeah, actually, I signed my son over to the B system, and I had no idea I was doing that with that birth certificate. It happened to me. It happened to all of us. Yeah. It happened to all of us. Yeah. I think that um, when you now go into the study of the 14th Amendment of 1868 and then the 44th Congress in 1871, um, uh, where the United States was actually made a corporation uh, written in capital letters, uh, this makes much more sense when you study these facts with this knowledge that's just given to you by, by this reading here. I do want to add one more thing. That uh, although you skipped it, and I understand because of the list uh, of names of CEOs and all these different corporations that were at this Bilderberg meeting, I think it's important that we mention a few of them because these same organizations uh, we've been told through the, uh, especially through the uh, alternative media, media, that it's the Jews who are running all these banks. Now we just learned that they went to go visit the Pope. And then the Pope is running this. Now let's look back at the name, some of the names of these, these organizations, banks, and otherwise, like AOL, AT&T, uh, Golden Sachs, uh, or the Warburg, Dylan Reed, uh, all these names that you'll hear in the alternative media. Oh, yeah, Walt Disney, um, just to name a few. Uh, of course, that's not a bank, but the ones polluting our minds. Uh, if we, oh, the Bank of America is another one. When you look at all this, and you hear over and over again that it's the Jews doing it, it's the Jews doing it, they're the ones that have corrupted us, they're the ones that are taking over the world. Well, why are the Jews going to the Pope? That's my question to all those who believe that. Why are they, they going to the Pope and bowing down to him? <laughs> they, have, they have no, they have, just like they said in the scriptures, we have no king but Caesar. There you go. Now, now you mentioned you mentioned Sunday a little bit ago, or Sabbath, the fourth commandment. Uh huh. Remember, the papacy has has accomplished its aim. It is now the governor of the world. Correct. All the governments of the world 
com, uh, make their laws consistent with Roman Catholic canon law. Every one of us are subject to Rome, wh- whether we like it or not, whether we protest or not. You can't leave your house without obeying or disobeying Roman law. The fourth and final beast on the earth will be Roman. Anybody that thinks the Jews rule the world simply deny what what a, what uh, what uh, the prophet Daniel confirmed in the scripture, what history affirms and proves to be true, that the four, fourth and final government of the world of the world will be Roman. Correct. And uh, we are subject to Roman law, not Jewish law. Yes, the Jews are in cahoots. And they serve the papacy, but after all, they have no king but Caesar. So, since all the world, so, since all the world wanders after the beast by being a part of this beast system and obeying all of its laws, we've literally assented that it is a god in the world. It is the lawgiver of the world, and every man, woman, and child must obey those laws. And, and we are attached to this beast system every time we assent to it, every time we, use, we, we sign our name to a, a document that has our name in all capital letters, which it identifies us as subjects of that corporation. You express the name of a corporation in all, in all capital letters. We assent to that every, every time we sign a government document. <clears throat> So, so we all comprehend that Rome has complete control of the civil laws of this land. Rome is ultimately the author of every civil law in this country. Now, the papacy claims to change God's law, doesn't he? And isn't that what he did? And he also changed the Sabbath, which God instituted the seventh day. Correct. Correct. And and the papacy makes it the first day of the week, Sunday, and the whole world wonders after him in obedience. You're not even allowed to bring into question what day is the Sabbath, because everybody accepts that Sunday is the Sabbath day. But that's enforced on civil terms, not biblical or scriptural and no one can no one can find one word in the scriptures that God ever anticipated a change of the Sabbath or changed the way one was to observe the Sabbath or its importance and significance. It's after all the fourth of 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 the Ten Commandments. Not one of those laws can be changed by a man, even if he calls himself God, like the Pope does. And so the papacy started out making himself the lawgiver of the world first by changing the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. And the whole world wonders after the beast. That's where all this started. And now, now we can, we can uh, and, and, and I think this is where Rome is going to put her mark on this entire thing, on this entire Roman system. The entire body of civil law is Roman Catholic canon law. And then, by the civil laws of the land, I truly believe that the papacy, together with the kings and the governments of the world, are going to institute Sunday as the national and international Sabbath. And if anybody questions this, there are multitudes of articles of the Pope traveling around the world claiming we must have Sunday. We must have Sunday. The civil laws, of the, the national and international laws that govern the European Union specifically embody Sunday as part of its constitutions and laws. So it, it already is forced by law. Now, right, so far in this country, we still have the privilege to take our rest on the day that God instituted. But there's coming a time, I believe, with all my heart, with no prejudice from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, okay? This is Tom speaking. I answer to Christ and him only. From what I've done in my research in the past, what continues today indicates to me that Rome has already played her hand. She's already shown us her card. Sunday is going to be required. 
and we're going to be subject to civil penalties if we do not observe that day in the fashion that the government that the that the the Vatican imposes upon us through the government through the civil laws of our of our land. Now this brings us back to our discussion in Romans chapter thirteen. We read Romans chapter thirteen and we discovered that the civil power has only power over the second table of the law. How man relates to man, how we relate to one another, it has no jurisdiction whatsoever over the first table of the law, the first four commandments. And this is where the shoe is going to drop. We allow the civil government to regulate the affairs of men among men. But are we going to allow the civil government to regulate affairs between man and God? That's where the line is drawn. And that is exactly where the papacy started its reign in 325 A.D. And that's how she's going to include it. All of it is embodied. All of this controversy is embodied in the Sabbath. Because if we observe the first day of the week, we observe the civil law of the papacy, the beast. And all of these other laws have simply just been added to it. Now, the Bible plainly tells us he will seek to change times and laws. He did. He changed the time of the Sabbath, and he changed the law of the Sabbath. And he made it his own. He changed the day. He changed the meaning. He changed the substance from Christ to Antichrist. And the civil laws of, of the land just follow suit. So what it, it all boils down to, you, you can take all the civil laws of this land, it won't have the punch that the papacy expects it to have until we all go to Mass on Sunday. And we're going to be forced by the civil law to do this. This is when the papacy and the governments of the world move from the second table of the law and make the first table of the law their jurisdiction. Not only are they going to make us observe a, the wrong day, but they're going to be taking the Lord's name in vain. They're also going to be bowing down and worshiping images and idols, and they're going to replace you know, the, the, the Creator as, as, as the, the object of our worship to the papacy. That's all four of the first table of the law. That's where it's at. If we give up, if we give up uh, our, our observance of the seventh day and accept the first, uh, the, for the first day of the week, then we will be forced to violate all four of the first table of the law through that Sunday Sabbath. Because when you go to Mass on Sunday, you violated the Sabbath. You bowed down and worshipped an image and an idol called the Pope and his Eucharist. You've also taken the Lord's name in vain. That's well, all for us. Well, Tom, I would argue that it's already happening. I mean, last time I went to a Baptist church, there was a flag there with an eagle on top. And everyone was bowing down to it, whether they were conscious or not of it. I argue that the civil government already is enforcing it through the 501c3 uh, program that they have. And just be, and, you know, that's what I see. I mean, uh, yeah, there are those exceptions. They allow others to do it on a Saturday. But you know what? The majority of people in this country and throughout the Roman Empire all worship on Sunday already. Do they need even to have a law? Maybe the law that you're talking about could still need to be implemented, and maybe that's what that capstone is in the back of our dollar bill implementing is, is this an absolute mandatory Sunday worship. But the Sunday worship, if it is going to be that, it has to revolve around the Roman Catholicism and worshiping the papacy, and it has to be ramped up beyond, in my opinion, than just Sunday worship. It has to be worshiping on Sunday to the Vatican, if you will, to the papacy, to, to the Roman institution. 
But at this stage, if you look at it, it already is going on. I mean, the average church in America has a flag with that golden fringe around it with a gold eagle on top of it. And what was happening 2,000 years ago in Herod's time when Christ showed up? <clears throat> you know, they had that, that image of the eagle there in the temple, you know, um, and that what happened prior to actually Christ showed up and the, the revolt that they had over that that eagle that was in the temple. It's the same thing. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed in 2,000 plus years. Nothing. Nothing at all. It's amazing. The more and more you study history, the more you realize it's the same stinking thing over and over again. I agree. I think the most interesting thing in this discussion is that with the Sunday law, or even the coming hour of ID chip, all the combination of the two would be just openly the mark of the beast. Because as Tom said before, uh, when a mother gives birth to his child and you get the child the birth certificate, then you unknowingly already sign the child up into the Roman papal system. But this is all done unknown to us. The only, uh, only thing when we can really know is it when they come out in the open for that, when they enforce that Sunday law, when you really have no other possibility than to oppose Rome, than to say, well, you can say Sunday is a day of worship, I don't worship that day, I keep my Sabbath, or I do not take an RFID chip in whatsoever kind, uh, okay, then I cannot buy and sell anymore, but that's when they come out in the open for that. So it has been done the last 2,000 years secretly, and surely the last 150 years, when you think back of what I just said, 1868 with the 14th Amendment, or 1871, the 44th Congress, the Act of 1871, as they call it, where the United States was made a corporation, and the same well, stuff was done also here in Europe after World War I with Germany, uh, when, when Germany became a corporation, uh, then they got all Europe in this. But the You're, people, yeah, but, but the people were not knowing of that, you know. I mean, we sure. tell them right now, but they, they don't. They don't know. I would, you know, you say secretly or unknowingly, but I would disagree with that. I don't think it's been secretly. I think the fact is that you and I have been indoctrinated and have been trained not to see what's right in front of our face all this time. That it hasn't been hidden from those who actually run the show, understand what's going on. And, you know, if you look in history, for a large chunks of human history under the Roman Empire, it wasn't hidden. It was not hidden in the past 2,000 years. It was right out in the open. I think the fact of the matter is, is this is new strategy that they've been using for the past couple hundred years through the Counter-Reformation has made it so that you and I have been thinking that it has been hidden, because you and I were not trained. Our eyes, our ears, our brain was not trained to recognize what was right in front of our face. And that's where I go back to with this American flag, with the eagle on top, with the gold fringe, that's in every freaking church in the United States of America. It was not that it was hidden. It was that you and I and the average you know, person on this planet wasn't educated in what they were actually looking at. You know, and that's the real issue. The issue is nothing was hidden from is that you and I were indoctrinated, lied to, by our own religious leaders, by our own politicians, by our own businessmen, of what the true story is, what what's really happening in front of our face. And don't forget the education system. Yeah. Or the indoctrination system. Yes. Uh, that all plays in one hand with the. Uh, externalization of the hierarchy reading that we did, taking God out of the school, taking God out of our personal uh, or daily lives. And when they do that, then we are indoctrinated in a way that, as you rightfully said, we just do not see that. We have been blinded. Right. We just, yeah. It's been hidden in the open, <laughs> like they always do. <laughs> hidden in plain sight. <laughs> hidden in plain sight, yes. There you go. We have no excuse then, do we? At this point, at least us three don't. <laughs> starting to starting to look pretty darn bleak. It's starting to look pretty darn bleak. Well, it seems to me that the only option that I have is uh, to get a backpack and uh, put some clothes in there and leave my home tomorrow and live on the streets and uh, try to avoid the system. That's the only solution that is there. 
<laughs> well, it's starting. It's starting to appear that the lifestyle that John the Baptist lived is the one that's beckoning to us. It's the one desirable, yes. Which is interesting because when you look at like in this country in particular, all the open spaces are big, taken over, controlled. All parks, all. I mean, they're, they're all controlled. I mean, they go out of their way to chase after folks who actually do try to break away from the system and live on their own and live off the land. I mean, there's one story after another. I know that we even know folks like, you know, Arthur, uh, Nicholas Arthur and his attempts to do it. But uh, I, there's replete stories of men who just said, you know what, I'm just going br- to take off. I'm no longer going to be part of the system. And, you know, look what happens to them. They chase them down. I'm not well, look, it. look what happened to John the Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> he was never part of the system, was he? No. They, they had no encumbrance upon him. He was God's man. He answered to God and God alone. And look what they did to him. Put him in prison and beheaded him. So what do we deserve? <clears throat> oh, God. <laughs> A good old beheading? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, it's it's a good question to ask. But the thing is, uh, when I when I was talking about this, especially for those of us who are so entrenched in the Roman system, and you're you're right there in the heart of it. Where are you to go? <laughs> good question. Where where are you to go? I mean, you know, the answer is to go to Christ. Let's go to the Bible and let's go and put your faith in Him. You know, this the fact of the matter. The Bible does tell us that this is what would happen in the end times. There would be nowhere else to go. We would have to stand firm in Babylon. We have to preach the truth, share the truth with people, share the truth of, of Jesus Christ. And we're not here to, to, to take on uh, the Babylon. We're not here to take on the Roman system. Who, who, teach the truth. And, you know, if, if, if we we're supposed to go and bust out and go somewhere, you know, please tell me where we go. The answer over and over again is that there's nowhere to go at this point. Except into Christ's arms and hope that he has enough mercy for us. He will save us. You know? Tell me if I'm wrong. Give me an example of a man or a woman who actually has truly 100% busted away from the grips of Rome. Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen YouTube videos of people who claim that they have freed themselves from this Roman system, but I, I, I really have my doubts. I do, too. They say they drive around with unregistered and unlicensed vehicles. They don't carry a driver's license. They don't have a bank account. Uh, they don't own any property, uh, yet they're free to come and go and do as they please. And... Uh, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not calling them liars, but, uh, uh, you know, I don't see any lawyers lining up to take you through all the legal necessities to absolutely free yourself from this Roman system. And uh, I have to believe that uh, people are just doing the best they can, and uh, Rome is just being patient with them until such time that it becomes uh, uh, that it becomes acceptable to do what they did <clears throat> to do to them what what they did to John the Baptist. Yeah. Lop off their heads. I think they're just living on borrowed time. The beast is not wanting to wake up the people, not wanting to make this an issue in the press for fear the people might rebel. And and those people who have seemingly uh, divorced themselves from this Roman system and are doing all these things, you know, not sending their kids to the public schools, not acknowledge, not uh, honoring their their personhood status, their American citizenship, not opening bank accounts, not getting driver's licenses, not getting registrations and license plates for their vehicles. Uh, I think they're just uh, they're just given a pass until such time as Rome rounds us all up. 
Now, there must be a reason for the thousands of guillotines here stuck all over the state of the uh, United States of America right now. Yeah. And uh, the legalization of beheading with uh, certain articles in Obamacare. York, did they have those guillotines in Europe? Do you know? Have you done research? Not, not that I know of. I'm very sorry. It's, it's the same like the FEMA camps that you have over there. I'm not aware of any kind of concentration camps uh, running up here in, uh, in Europe. I don't know. So I think... That is, that is my idea of what's coming, that here in Europe they will start another war and will get rid of, rid of the people in, in that way. Yeah, another but, inquisition. Yeah, but another we, are, we are used to war here in Europe, uh, unlike you in the United States of America. You have never had a war on your own soil, except for that, uh, yeah, let's call it bogus civil war between 61 and 65 in, in the 1900s, uh, 1800s. But we in Europe here have been have had wars uh, the last two thousand uh, two thousand years all over. We are used to that here. So, and uh, we have to see also the role in Russia in that. And um, it makes to me very much sense that we will go through another war, and by that war, they will go to annihilate all the people that will not stand uh, with the Antichrist. Well, it seems to be a necessity too with these wars. It's almost like a generational thing, too, that they need to... Rome needs to use these wars to control us, to kind of weed out the heretics, if you will, or those that might threaten the system. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a generational thing, whether it's Europe or in America, where they actually just send our youth overseas to die. <laughs> yeah, that, that, because there, was, there, was a, there was a very smart man, I don't know who it was, but he said every generation, again, has to fight for its freedom. So when one generation just finished the war, then you cannot start uh, another war within the same generation. You have to grow a new generation of people that you can first indoctrinate that they then are willing to go into another war. That's why you seldom have two different, at least big wars, within one generation. But the thing is, too, though, what you said about fighting for your, your freedom, every generation must fight for the freedom. Well, obviously that's not true because every generation fights for their own enslavement. That's what happens over and over again, right? Yeah, they think they fight for freedom, but it's uh, freedom on the wrong terms, you know. Right. Uh, it's like, it's like the, the Babylonian system uses the word freedom and peace, and they don't tell you, well, yeah, okay, we want freedom and we want everybody to be free. But what they don't tell you is that they want everybody to be free from the laws of God and from the bondage of God. There you go. And um, there comes into play their card of humanism. And um, I, <clears throat> there's this one, uh, this one thing that I said uh, some, some time ago. Uh, laws given by man can be taken away by man and laws given by God last eternal. The problem is that we all, we all live only in the uh, in, in the laws of man and not in the laws of uh, of God. Mm. It is, or like uh, Walter V says, the kingdom of the south, uh, humanism. Uh, <laughs> the north would be the kingdom of the north. Well, our day, it, it would be Rome. And uh, so you it's have hard, It's hard to argue with Walter V on that count. He makes a lot of sense. Oh yeah, he does. And, and if you look at Europe too, to my time. In Europe, I spent you know the three years I spent in England and a lot of time in Portugal. And my observations in, in Europe is is that you literally have those two choices. It comes down to uh, be a Roman Catholic or be a communist atheist. And what's the difference? You know, we're talking spiritually now. You know, we're talking King of the North, King of the South, and also politically, these are two choices you have. That's what the world wants to offer all of us. This Roman system, either you bow to Rome. The papacy, and if it's not going to be the case, and we'll give you this humanistic kingdom of the south thing, where you know you can be an atheist and a humanist, but uh, and they don't. It doesn't seem to bother them as long as you're paying homage to them in some way or form, and they know that because you don't have God on your side, there's nothing to defend you. You're you're no threat to them. You're no threat to the papacy. The whole object, the whole object of the papacy and the governments of the world, is the same object that that Israel's enemies used against them. That was to cause the Israelites to offend their own God 
and then he would no longer defend them, and they would be easily uh, destroyed. They would be easily overcome in war, and it, it repeats itself. That's a theme that repeats itself over and over and over in the scriptures. Sure. That the that the the false gover- the false gods of the heathen nations that surrounded Israel didn't necessarily make a direct attack on Israel, but simply caused them to offend their own God, and then He destroyed them. And that's exactly what the Vatican and the governments of the world intend to do to us, to cause us to so offend our own God that we have no defense. And it's worked quite marvelously, and, and, and you can't ascribe any geniusness to them. All they had to do was read the Bible and see how Israel was destroyed. Oh, yeah. They... So, so what's the secret? Don't offend God anymore. Amen. And you, you, we've all agreed that there's only one help for us. And it's not going to come from the church or the state. It's going to come from God and God only. And right now he's poised to destroy us all. We've all got the mark of this beast upon us. With, we profess Christ with our mouth. We serve the papacy with everything we think, do, and say. And and God is poised to destroy us all. They've accomplished, the priest of Baal in Rome has accomplished exactly what the priests of Baal in Babylon did against God's people. Caused them to so offend their God that God had no choice to uh, but to honor his own name and bring judgment to his own people. And that's exactly where we stand today. I mean, everybody's worried about the government. They're talking about revolution. They're talking about the government uh, imposing, you know, military power against its own citizenry, like they did at Waco or like they did at Ruby Ridge or like they did in the Oklahoma City bombings, like they did on 9-11. They're worried about the government destroying us. I'm worrying about God. Well, that's a smart approach. That's very good. <laughs> I mean, the problem, the problem here is Thomas. You can't, you, you can't argue with him. No. <laughs> well, the one, thing, the one thing I'd say too is, you know, I just did a study on my show uh, last night. I did two parts on uh, Daniel 11. If you uh, did the historical application of Daniel 11, you see what was going on with the the Israelites and the, the Jewish nation, if you will, whatever you want to call them, from Daniel's time in Babylon all the way to the, uh, the coming of Christ. And uh, literally, it's the same old story over and over again. And it really, it, it, it supports what Tom is saying. There is no answer. There's no man-made answer. There's no political answer. There's no worldly answer. The only answer to our dilemma is God. And following him, and so far, you know, it comes down to when we read the, the scriptures, we research well, the best that we can with our understanding. There's only one way to honor and satisfy him, and that's by following his commandments. Now, people, the most of the world is going to say you're being legalistic. But, you know, I don't really care what the rest of the world thinks at this point, because I know, just like myself, they're deceived to the hilt. I don't care what that pastor thinks. I don't care what anybody thinks. I want to know what God thinks so that I might have a chance to do what is right for once in my life, if that makes sense. So, you know, I, when you go back to the Scriptures, now you start with Thomas saying about the Sabbath and and what that truly means, you know, for men in our position, what does that mean to our best for our understanding? It means to rest in the Lord on the seventh day. we got to, based on our own understanding, what is it? That's Saturday. And, uh, I God have mercy on us that we're doing the right thing, you know, because, you know, <clears throat> we can't really count on the average man to tell us the truth because they're walking bag of lies and deception. Now, that is, I mean, when I say that, I say that in all, all humility, I'm not knocking them personally, the man, it, but as we talked about earlier, you know, we're so blinded, we can't even see the truth right in front of us. We can't see, the, <clears throat> it's all, you know, like I said, it's hidden in plain sight, so, we, what other answer do we have at this point? 
you know, there's you know, it's, it's scripture, scripture alone, it's Christ, Christ alone, and then if Christ says, you know, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, then you keep his commandments. And you know what? The irony is going to be is that Christianity is going to hate us for it. That's right. And when they kill us, they'll think they're doing God's service. Yeah. I say the next inquisition against God's true people in this country are going to be by the hand of people who call themselves Christians. Absolutely. It's going to be the ecumenical evangelibellies who've been taught futurism, that the Pope is not the Antichrist, the papacy is not the Antichrist, it's a single individual at the end of time, and they're going to start viewing us, the few historicists in this country, as religious fanatics, as religious extremists, as religious fundamentalists, and they've already used those terms to, de- to, to demonize us, to make us demons in the eyes of the world, to justify what they fully intend to do to us. It is the people who now call themselves Christians who will be killing us and thinking they are doing God's service. It seems like the average Catholic has been taught to hate the Jews and the average, quote-unquote, Protestant has been taught to hate Protestants that observe Bible believers. Yeah, they, that's what they've been taught to hate. <laughs> I, I might be wrong, but that's that's my impression when I listen to a Roman Catholic, uh, you know, shows on online and all that. A lot of these guys are Roman Catholic. They focus on Jews and Jews and Jews, and then there's this other group of Protestants that seem to focus on folks who would just obey that they. Um, the Sabbath. So. I don't call them Protestants anymore. I call them ecumenical evangelibellies. I agree. They're, they're, they've joined the harlot church, the scarlet harlot of Revelation chapter 17. They've, they've sold their birthright, just like Esau did. Yeah, like uh, the Roman, uh, the, uh, the Lutheran World Convention signed this treaty with the Roman Catholic Church in 1999 which is mentioned in the video of Kenneth Topin that I mentioned in the beginning of this broadcast. That's they where the Lutherans t- and the so-called Protestants all sold out to the Roman system. Yeah. Rome intended for the European Union to be the first, glo- the first Roman Catholic superstate, and they've accomplished it. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, founding, and, uh, the, and, the founding of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the EU goes back to Joseph Rettinger, who was a Jesuit. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <you will. laughs> There's nothing more to say than that. Everywhere. Well, ever. every, every pope since, uh, you know, even the Roman Catholic Church acknowledges that every pope since John the Twenty Third has been an anti-pope, which is the same as Roman Catholics calling their popes antichrists. Mm-hmm. But I say it goes all the way back to 1814 when the Jesuits uh, were reinstated. Yeah, that's a and, very and point. they they got control of the papacy at that time. And every Roman every pope, every pope, it may not have been a Jesuit himself, but he was certainly controlled by the Jesuit general. And this is widely known now among researchers. Well, I I don't know. You want to go on with the reading? Or do you, I mean, I'm certainly having fun talking about this. Where we can move on. <laughs> I don't know if we're having fun, but we're really. Well, I could hardly call it fun. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I I, I, am, I am enjoying the conversation because the truth of the matter is, gentlemen, without you two, I don't really have any opportunity to have this conversation. So thank you. Well, the no. same here. I can only say my, my head is spinning so much from the revelation that I've had the last uh, 75 minutes here uh, that, uh, okay, we, we can go on and make our next point, or we can even go a little bit further in the discussion that we're having here right now, because I think this is also very relevant to our listeners. And we can continue another time with the other points, because my head is spinning so much, I don't think that I have the concentration to concentrate on another point of the characteristics of the Antichrist anymore, because we have, if, if we didn't, uh, if we didn't uh, identify him with reading this last point, point 18 that was, or the other points that we did before, we surely will not identify him with the points to come, but we can uh, maybe go on a little bit to this and also try to uh, 
give our listeners a little bit of security where to look for salvation. Well, yeah, that's the answer. The answer, because once you realize that you are, you already live under the mark of the beast, that you uh, this waiting for something in the future to happen, you've been fooled, deceived once again, something in the future. It is, they, you have to deal with this. You have to honestly deal with it once and for all. You know, I actually live under the mark of the beast. Absolutely. And so it's, not just, it's just not Mike Adams or Jorg Glisman or Tom Fress. You know, it's anyone who's under the, the umbrella of the Roman Empire. So what do we do? Yeah, that's a good question. What do we do? The point is that uh, <laughs> even, even we can claim ourselves to be Bible-believing and Jesus-following Christians. When we die today and then we fall asleep and the day of judgment comes, we have nothing to defend ourselves because we were living a lie in this Roman, papal, antichrist system, whether knowingly or not knowingly. And after today, it is even uh, more difficult, at least for me, I think, in the future to go on with this life because, I don't know, it was, that what Tom just said there, that, that was very revealing to me at uh, it's I, always devastating. Thought, I always thought that I had a chance with the things that I studied the last years um, to avoid the uh, mark of the beast. And now he tells me, no, you don't. You have been born with it all along. You know, that's, that's like a shock to me for the moment, I really have to say. I have to digest that first. Yeah. Well, I, I can understand what you're saying because it's very devastating. You finally realize that's what's going on in your whole life. And you've been deceived and lied to by everybody. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's once again it's the blind leading the blind. So, yeah, what is the answer? Well, I have an answer. Oh, please, please. share. And that is the first part of Daniel chapter 9. When Daniel gets down on his knees and confesses his sins and the sins of his people, it's a gut-wrenching confession. Embodied in that confession is the realization that while Israel was claiming the Creator to be their God, they actually worshipped Baal, the God of the Babylonians. They had mixed the holy with the profane. They had sought to worship God after the traditions of men, and uh, they were being punished. And are we not being punished? Every one of us are slaves. We're both. We're all poor because all of our money has gone to support this antichrist papal system. Daniel repented, and when he did, God sent him an angel. Would you like showed, to? Would you like to do a reading of Daniel chapter nine then? This, uh... This prayer that he says. Well, certainly if it's appropriate, I mean, to what you intended for this. Uh, yeah, I event. absolutely think it's appropriate because I think also a lot of uh, a lot of the listeners answer. out there will have spinning ears and they have probably no idea what you're talking about when you talk about Daniel chapter nine, except for the first verses, because a lot of people maybe know verse 24 through 27 which we have made another broadcast on. That's not the point right now. What's amazing but, about Daniel 9 is it, it's the answer. It literally is the answer to all our dilemmas, all problems. That particular chapter. It's amazing. The more and more you study Daniel, the more you realize how important it is to understand that book. <laughs> it really is to really comprehend what it's really coming from, what it's really trying to teach us, what Daniel's really trying to teach uh, well, God, through Daniel, is trying to teach us. And yeah, when you read the Old Testament, when you read Daniel, and you understand that there still was a time when people were walking with God, opposite to what it is today. Actually, Daniel 9 is even more powerful than that. Daniel's experience, Daniel 9 is our experience. The average, the average Jew or Israelite at that time was not walking with God. And that's an understatement. They thought they were God's people, but they weren't. Yeah. Not not spiritually. They worshiped Baal. They 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 mixed the worship of God with the worship of Baal. 
And that's what's going on today, isn't it? That's exactly Ezekiel, what's going Ezekiel on. Ezekiel chapter 8 shows precisely how they did it. Now, of course, it was much broader in scope, that apostasy, than what is revealed in Daniel or Ezekiel chapter 8. But, but certainly, it's a good indication. And if you can read Dan, or Ezekiel chapter 8 and see the equivalent apostasies in quote-unquote Christianity today, you understand we're in the exact same situation that, uh, that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in 25 well, years ago. I would, I would merit very much love it if you would go into that, Tom, right now. Okay. Well, if you're we, prepared to do that. I don't want to force you into something. Like, you know? I'll do the best I can, but you know what the hazards are for me when I read these things, but I'll do the best I can. We'll begin in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1. Remember, Daniel learns through the leading of the Holy Spirit, through reading of Scripture, that Israel would be 70 years in Babylonian captivity, that, he were, that they were being punished by their own God, whom they had offended by mixing the holy with the profane, by mixing the worship of Baal with the, the worship of Almighty God. And uh, they had trampled on his law. They had trampled on his Sabbath. And uh, they're in big trouble. And Daniel comes to the realization of why they were being punished by their own God, the God of creation. He begins Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books, that is, books of the Bible, I understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek my prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the commandment of mercy, uh, keeping the covenant of mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets which spake in thy name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of face, as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel that are near and that are afar off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his word, which he spake unto us, 
and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he hath doeth, which he doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that hath brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and hast gotten thee renowned as at this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake, not for ours, for the Lord's sake. Daniel is literally pleading with God, have mercy upon us for thy sake, not for ours. Restore the glory of your name. Restore Jerusalem, that the faith of Almighty God might not be erased from the earth because of our disobedience. Do you see what Daniel's praying? Not for our sake, Father God, but for your own sake, restore Jerusalem and the temple that the faith of Almighty God might, but might not be erased from the whole earth. Continuing in verse 18. Oh, my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. He's calling upon God to show his mercies even more powerfully than he has shown his judgment against the Israelites for their apostasy. He said, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, the evening oblation that would have been going on in Jerusalem had not the Jews sinned against God. But there was no oblation, no sacrifice in Israel, because the Israelites had all been taken captive. Judah had all been taken captive into Babylon. The city and the sanctuary were destroyed. There was no sacrifice on that mountain. Daniel is pleading we have sinned against thee. We have forsaken thy law. We have mixed the holy with the profane. We deserve uh, God's judgment. We deserve the wrath that you've imposed upon us. But we are the only people on the earth that are known by thy name. 
Shall the God of Israel be destroyed in the earth because he destroyed us? Will he leave no man upon the earth to carry on his righteousness? Or will he have mercy on a backslidden, apostate, and lawless people and restore them to their land for his name's sake? For the sake of the true God of Israel, Daniel was literally afraid that if God did not have mercy upon his wayward and disobedient and apostate and idolatrous people, that the name of God would literally be removed from the earth. And is that not exactly where we are today? Is this not an appropriate prayer for anyone who worships the God of glory? Now, all I can do is apologize to those critics who hear the emotion and the cry of my voice, and all they can think to themselves is Jimmy Swaggart and phony. Let me tell you something. This is the prayer of my heart, and you take it the way God gives it to you or walk away. That's all I have. Wow. Leaving me speechless here. This was so intense, Tom. That's how it feels like when the truth strikes you. And whether you acknowledge it or you walk away from it, it still stays the truth. The prayer of Daniel to keep the word of God in this world. Because if he wouldn't save the people from the Babylonian captivity, the word of God would have been erased from the face of the earth. And Satan would have his his total rule. At least that's what I get from that. Michael, do you have something? Because I'm almost speechless. Uh, Well, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, Daniel gives us what the answer is. It's just, and as Tom says, fall on our face and beg for mercy for, uh, for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our nations, um, and remember that it's for the Lord's sake, not us, and that um, all we can do is do what we're doing. Uh, is share this message. Share the importance of the message of Daniel. Show, share the message that um, Daniel's 70th week was already fulfilled 2,000 years ago, that all that what we see coming out of the mainstream media, the churches, what's in the Middle East, all of that is not of God, and that we need to return to the Scripture. We need, we need to return to the truth that's in the Scripture. We need to return to God's law. Yes. And, uh, and reject man's law. Reject the law of the Roman beast. The Babylonian priest who he is no no Christ, no vicar of Christ. He is the vicar of Satan. And even our government serving. We're as apostate as Israel was. We're as apostate as Judah, Judah was. We, 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 we can't ask God to take away our reproach. All we can do is ask God to vindicate his own name. To vindicate his own name. Because we have profaned it. Yeah. You know, we hear this bogus argument over and over and over again that 
uh, we are being legalistic. Well, everything's been flipped upside down. In truth, they are being legalistic. Those who follow Rome, Rome's teachings, uh, uh, accusing us of just simply saying, hey, follow t- God's simple Ten Commandments, uh, they're the ones who are legalistic. They're the ones who are actually enslaving us. And we um, have to warn as many people as we can of what, what we know to be the truth. That our answer is the Scripture, Scripture alone, Christ, Christ alone, and what Christ says in the, and what our Lord and Savior says in the Bible. And follow, listen to what he says. Not, don't listen to the pastor. Don't listen to the church. Don't listen to the politician. Don't listen to the papacy. Don't listen to the Antichrist system. It's designed deliberately to mislead us completely and enslave us. And ultimately to send us straight to frickin' hell. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I think what this prayer made uh, very clear is that uh, we should look for a Daniel of our time who is praying in the name of God for us to well, leave the system. Well, he's praying for the name of God for him and his people, but he's the example for us today. He is the example. And uh, I Dan- think we should all be Daniels. Every one of us have the commission. If this prayer is written upon your heart, then you are a Daniel. That's a good point. I agree, agree. So there's the answer to what we do uh, in this system that we're under, that we've been enslaved in since our birth. If we look at Daniel's example, Daniel didn't you know, flee from Babylon. He stood firm in Babylon. And he taught the truth. He he did the, he he followed the word of God. He followed the teachings of God the best that he could in his situation. And God recognized that. He was beloved of God. And that's the reason why we even have the understanding today that the the papacy is the antichrist. As the guest three says, the vicar of Satan. And uh you know that's that's why we have this understanding, because a man stood firm in God, in Babylon, and we're in the same situation. It, it, Daniel had nowhere to go but to God, and we have nowhere to go but to God, too. That's our situation. And that's the brutal reality. And, yet, you know, it's the wonderful reality, because God is our answer. And so I get an immense amount of hope reading Daniel, which prior to starting, you know, this journey of reading Daniel, I couldn't understand any of it. And today, I get the understanding that I have today of Daniel, it's so much more, so much pure and wonderful. And uh, Daniel is, is a great amount of hope. And, you know, and this, you know, this whole battle is not a battle of nations. It's, 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 it's for us. It's an individual thing. It's uh, who are you going to follow God, or are you going to follow the ways of man? Are you going to follow this antichrist system, or are you going to follow God? Make your choice today, right? And uh, there we are. There's where we stand, and nothing's changed. And it's interesting how history just keeps repeating itself over and over and over again. It's just the magnitude of it. It gets greater and greater and greater until. That blessed day when our the second coming, when he, when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ comes back, and I, I I pray that you, Jorg and Tom and I will will be there, and all those who are listening and all those who are not listening, that they will meet their Lord and Savior and be one of His children, and uh, it seems to be this ultimately this is what it's all about. It's it's it's. it's it seems like life is just about that. It's about making a choice. Who do we serve today? Who will we serve for eternity? And most people have chose the Antichrist system. Most people have chose the papacy or this beast system. And when I say most, let me rephrase that. The absolute majority <laughs> have chosen that. And there's nothing we can do about it because we can't make their decision. We can only... 
by the grace of God. Even if you think about it, you're, apparently God loved us enough to um, help us understand Daniel. That's amazing. Because most people don't, who even are quote-unquote call themselves Christians don't understand Daniel at all. No, in the sentence that uh, Jesus said, <clears throat> it's not because you, uh, you call me Lord, Lord, and I have not known them, makes much more sense after reading this. Yeah, and it listen, makes you know, so much more sense. When I say the Lord loves us enough to help us understand Daniel, that's not because you and I did anything. It's because he did something. It's an expression of his mercy that we yeah. understand Daniel. Yeah, we didn't come up with it in the in the in our own intellects. We only comprehend this because God was merciful to us and allowed us to understand this. And it's amazing because I look at myself as a filthy sinner and somebody who's not. I don't feel I deserve any of it. And I, the riches that I have come that have come to me through understanding Daniel, the book of Daniel. There, it's the gold. It's not the brass. It's the gold. We are actually receiving the true riches, and it's wonderful. I mean, it's, we are really blessed, and the rest of the world might not see that. The rest of the world might think we're nutcase, and who cares what they think? You know, but if, you know, maybe we could help that one person. That one person will hear this, one of God's children, and say, "Oh, okay, hey, I, I'm I'm going to come aboard, Christ." My Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, I'm going to come on board and I'm going to follow. To the best of my ability, I'm flawed, I'm a man, I will never be good enough. But you're my hope. You're my salvation. This Babylonian system that we're under, this Roman system, this Roman empire that we live under is not the answer. It will never be the answer. Christ is our answer. And it's, 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 the more and more you learn, the more you realize how simplistic the truth is, this, the answer is, and how the whole world's at enemy with it. And what do we do except to do what we're doing now? Have this show, speak the truth. Hope that somebody will hear it. You know, we live in a day and age where you can't just go in a corner street and, 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 and share this. Um, this is the time, a sign of the times. We have to be on this on talkshoe.com, and a guy from uh, a guy from Europe, and a guy from Iowa, and a guy from Ohio, are getting together and actually have a conversation because that's the times that we live in. But those times are are the same. This is similar as what Daniel was going through. I mean, look how many Daniel, uh, how many of his friends did he have? How many friends did he mention in that book? There wasn't that many, was there? There wasn't even a handful. There was him and three friends, right? <laughs> That's where we are. We're at the same time. It's amazing. Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed at all. I just want to thank the Lord to give me the opportunity to be on the show today and have that understanding of Daniel that I have right now because of Tom's wonderful and impressive reading that he did. And that was not a reading, that was a plea. Prayer. Yeah, it was a prayer. It should be a model prayer for God's people today. Well, I only hope something can take much out of you. (laughs) I won't be much good for the rest of the day. (laughs) <laughs> well, I think we we we've got the point across this this show. I think uh, it was a very it was an excellent show, gentlemen. Not only did we once again expose who the Antichrist is and uh, the affiliations to the Antichrist that are global, but the answer and how deep the deception actually goes. Yeah. I think that has become more clear today, even to people who thought that they know the truth, that they have been shown something new. Well, I mean, after today, after figuring out that you've been enslaved since your birth, uh, why should you trust anything as far as man goes? <laughs> right? <laughs> Man's institutions, whether it's political or or you know, the education system or the religious systems that are out there, the Babylonian religion that we're under, why should we trust any of it? 
we need to put our trust in in God. That's it. There's, you know, there there's no other there's no other way out. And uh, you know, all these these guys, these uh, preppers, and these guys who are you know fight this and God bless them. But if they miss the big picture, at, um, and you know, I think that's what uh, Nicholas Arthur was trying to say in the last show too. Although you know, the show kind of didn't quite go the way I wanted, but regardless. Um, uh, the fact is, that, you know, when I asked him, well, so what are the answers? What are the solutions? How does a guy get out of the system? And he was stopped and done found it. And he says, you know, you know, yeah, you know, it's well, get right with God, basically. You know, Christ. You start studying the Bible. That is our answer. But there's nothing, you know. It's the same thing it was, you know, what Martin Luther was telling us, and the reformers were telling us, and <laughs> everybody who's been close to God has been trying to tell us all along. And it's just too simple of an answer, isn't it? It's just, you know, for us, you know, because of our pride or ego, because of what, uh, how we've been indoctrinated, how we've been told from a very early age that we are the answer. Michael, uh, you have to understand that when most people hear the word, we have to return to God, they view that as the equivalent of we must go back to church on yes. Sunday. We we must worship Jesus, and, you know, the law is dead. We're under grace now, and go right back to the, into the apostasy. You know, the backslider thinks the solution, the, the actual putting into practice of going back to God is to go back to the church. And I'm telling you, that's where the deception comes from, from the churches. Amen. You're right. Satan is occupying the space behind the pulpit. He's not exposing Rome's control over us religiously and civilly. There's no answer in the churches. All there is is a bunch of tongue speaking and weepy eyes and tears and emotionalism and social programs and just just entertainment, when and where, what church in this country would could read Daniel's, uh, uh, Daniel's prayer and understand precisely what Daniel was talking about? Well, they at least for, in your they country, you have some churches that could still do that. In my country, yeah, there's not one church that could do that either. Well, part of the dilemma is, though, when you look at these churches, if a man were to read that, let's say their pastor would to study and read Daniel 9 to him, he would finally have to come to the same conclusion that we have. He would have to tell his parishioners or his lay people, that, oh, by the way, folks, you're now going to have to leave this church. You're going to have to leave this church, this building, this organization, and you're going to have to develop a personal relationship with Christ, and you're going to have to read that Bible. And that I have been misleading you all along, and I am repenting, and I'm asking you for forgiveness and God's forgiveness. Do you think that's going to happen? No, it's not going to happen, because those men have invested too much into their legalistic system. They're the ones under the legal system. It's not us. They there's, are. No, there's no sign of repentance in the churches. Sunday's still the Sabbath, always will be. And uh, they're never going to return to God's law. They're going to keep mixing the holy with the profane, and they're going to call it Christianity. They're set in their ways. There's no repentance in their heart. You've got to get out of the churches. That's all there is to it. You have to read the Scriptures under the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit. You have to read the Scriptures for what they say, not by what the church has taught you. The scriptures have to be read all over again, and before anybody's going to be able to understand what the scriptures really say is to first take off from their face the church's glasses. Stop reading the scriptures through the context of futurism. Stop reading the scriptures in the context of Sunday Sabbath. Stop reading the scriptures in the context of Christmas and Easter and all the other Babylonian uh, traditions of men that have crept into the church and now become the orthodox teaching. We have to depart from what is being taught as orthodox in the churches and return to the written word of God, and that is only found 
in the King James Version of the Bible. If you're reading one of those other apostate Bibles by whatever name, you're not going to get God's truth. And I'll tell you, everyone that reads from a Bible other than the King James Version of the Bible is never going to be able to read Daniel's prayer and understand what his true confession was. Daniel confessed our sins, and until we understand what Daniel was praying about, we're going to go back to God by going back to the churches. That's where the corruption was in Daniel's day, and that's where the corruption is today. They had profaned the worship of God. Where was that taking place? In the temple of God. And that's where it is today. In the, in the churches is where the corruption is spread all among us. So we have to return to the scriptures and get out of the churches. The Bible plainly tells Revelation 18, 4 and 5, Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues, because God hath remembered her iniquities. She, he has not forgotten their iniquities. He hasn't forgotten that they profaned his Sabbath and called Sunday the first day of the week a Sabbath. He has not forgotten their Babylonian Christmas and Easter. He has not forgotten their abominations by saying that God's law is dead. The Bible plainly says, we uphold the law. Yes, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, but he didn't do away with it. Who could read any one of the Ten Commandments and say that law is dead? The Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery. The church says that law is dead. Well, in that case, Yerk, do you mind if I borrow your wife tonight? Do you see how ridiculous this is? Do you see how ridiculous this is? I only see how amazing that is that uh, two or three minutes before you started citing Revelation 18, I opened that up and I wanted to relay on that because at the time of Daniel, people only have had the Old Testament. We have been blessed with the New Testament also, and Revelation 18, 4 and 5 is a resemblance of the prayer of Daniel 9 that you just read to our generations today. That's what I wanted to state, and then you come along and read it, man. You take the words out of my mouth. <laughs> well, the Spirit does that, see. We're all of one mind and one accord, like the apostles were. When the truth sinks to the marrow of your bones, all of a sudden there's no disagreement. No, yes. We're all one in the truth. And it's like when one speaks, uh, he uses the words of everyone else in the group. We all affirm this. Look, let me continue with the Ten Commandments. You can go to Exodus chapter 20, read them all. There's only one among them that any Christian would say is abolished. The first commandment says that I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Does that mean we can have one after him or beside him? No. No. We're to have no other gods. Now, which Christ, what Christian would say that that law is abolished? None. The second commandment, forbidding idolatry. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or the earth beneath. Thou shalt not bow down and worship them and serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy to the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Is there any Christian who seriously calls himself a Christian and say that we now may make and bow down and worship images and idols now that we're under grace? Not a one. Not a one who is intellectually honest. How about, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For God will not forgive them to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Okay? Which one of us would say it's okay now that we're under grace to take the name of the Lord our God in vain? And you can go right down. That's the first, except for one, that's the first table of the law. How about the second table of the law? Shall we commit murder now that we're under grace? Shall we bear false witness now that we're under grace? Shall I exchange the use of my wife with someone else now that I'm under grace? 
commit adultery? There's not one single one of those laws that any intellectually honest Christian, despite what they say with their mouth, that God's law is dead, not a single one of them would they say is now lawful because we're under grace. There's only one law in the whole body of the Ten Commandments that every Christian would say is changed. And that's the Sabbath law. The seventh day has now become the first day. And if you question that to anyone who calls himself a Christian today, you're apostate. Well, the problem you know, is... You know, I, I've, I've, I've talked to Christians for years and years and years. I've told, I, I've told them that, don't you know, in the Roman Catholic Catechism, that they've literally taken out the entire second commandment, forbidding, bowing down, making, and worshiping images and idols. It's completely gone out of the catechism. And then they separated the tenth commandment, forbidding covetousness, into two. Okay? To, to make up the difference. Now it's still ten commandments after they've removed the second commandment completely. <laughs> well, most Christians will say, well, they, they can't do that. They can't. They can't take out the second commandment. Well, who do those Catholics think they are? Who does the Pope think he is? Now I understand why the Roman Catholics bow down and worship images and idols in their churches. Now I understand why there's images of Mary all over the world. Now I understand why there are every kind of idolatry displayed, even on the frescoes of the Vatican, why those Catholics are apostate. And then I simply, after they get all done beating up the Catholics, then I say, well, what about the Fourth Commandment? And now all of a sudden it gets real quiet. It gets real quiet. And then all of a sudden the hatred comes out like you wouldn't believe. They're ready to kill you for suggesting that they adhere not to God's Sabbath, but they adhere to a man's Sabbath, the Pope's Sabbath, the Roman Catholic Church Sabbath, the Sunday, the venerable day of the sun, the very day that was worshipped by the priests of Baal, the very day that was observed by every pagan religion on the planet. Now all of a sudden, they're ready to, rather than change, Rather than to take the Scripture exactly what it says, they're ready to join the Roman Catholic Church and saying, well, we can excuse the Catholics then for bowing down and worshiping images and idols. You can see where they're going in the ecumenical movement. If they join the ecumenical movement, the whole object of the ecumenical movement is to get everyone to to celebrate the Mass. One communion. That's what the Vatican cloaks it as. We're all going to have communion together. Well, it's not going to be a remembrance of Christ's birth or death as it's proclaimed in the Scriptures. It's going to be a re-sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the same sacrifice as, was, as Jesus was subjected to on that cross. Humiliation. And that's what it is. And if that's not apostasy, global apostasy, under the name of Christianity, then you simply don't understand what Daniel's praying here. In Daniel chapter 9. Christianity is not going to repent of their Babylonian doctrines. They're not going to repent of their Babylonian futurism. They're not going to repent of their Babylonian Sunday. And they're not going to repent of their Babylonian Christmas and Easter. And they're going to continue to bake cakes to the Queen of Heaven just like Israel did, and the, and, and the judgment of Almighty God is upon them. We don't have to worry about our own government destroying us. We have to worry about God destroying us. Unless we repent, Daniel repented. He had found himself one day awakened to the reality that he was under the rod of God. His whole nation was under the rod of God and forced to obey the beast of their day.
King Nebuchadnezzar, just the, the Babylonian equivalent of the papacy today. He ruled the whole world, he made all the laws, and he forced people to bow down and worship his system. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just simply wouldn't do it. We will not bow down and worship your image. God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your image. Where is that kind of faith today? It's a real example for us today. We find ourselves in the exact same position as Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. There is no difference except for the date on the calendar. We serve the modern-day beast just exactly the way Judah served the, the, the ancient-day beast. Tom, I'd like to say a couple things. Um, <clears throat> First of all, like Walter Feast says in his, some of his series, he says, you know, what we what we want is a savior. We don't want a lord, or we don't want a king. You know, we want somebody to save us, but we don't want to serve them. But here's something else, like about the deception. And I shared this with uh, Jorg, and uh, I got this from a good friend of mine, acquaintance of mine. Um, I don't know if he uh, cares if I mention his name or not, so I won't mention his name, but most people know him. Anyways, the Dewey Reams Bible, which I understand is actually the Jesuit Bible, guess what that says in Exodus 20? It says this. Now, there's a reason why I'm bringing this up, and I'm going to read this. Now, it's talking about, and it says this, Thou shalt not make thyself in a, grave, uh, a graven image, nor the likeness of of anything that is in heaven above or on earth beneath, nor of those things that are the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not adore them, nor serve them. I am the Lord thy guide, mighty, jealous, visiting the iniquities of the fathers of their children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now the question I have, folks, for anybody who listens to this or is listening to this is, and of course, you know, I brought this up when someone just found left, so. <laughs> um, question is, okay, the question is, folks, here's the Jesuits, your leadership in the Roman Catholic Church and in the leadership in all these other apostate churches, in the Roman Catholic Church, they're, they're, they've literally taken that out of your Catholic catechism, of your Bible, but they kept it in their Bible. Ask yourself why that is. Good question. Ask yourself why that is, and you know why would they deceive you, but not deceive themselves? Is there some kind of motive? Is there some kind of gain? Well, it's um, a little bit of um, you know. Uh, you have the inside knowledge and you have the outside knowledge or outside teaching you know well i think it goes it, it goes line, in hand in hand with what we're talking about and that is just as in the times of, uh, of daniel and of the, of the israelites and all the way up to christ the leadership was always messing with the word of god deceiving the people and not teaching them the truth why is that because if you actually teach god's children his commandments, his truth, guess what? They start following God instead of you, the priest. That's the issue. And the issue is, once again, that uh, this Babylonian system that we're under, once again, the whole objective is to take the Word of God away from us because the Word of God actually frees us. It liberates us. They know this. This is a reason why they hide it from their the lay, peer, the lay person in the Roman Catholic Church. Because you know what? If lay, uh, lay members of the Catholic Church actually were encouraged to read the true Word of God, none of them would be Roman Catholic. They would do like uh, all these other Reformers did 500 years ago on, who would start to see that their leadership was lying to them, it was an enmity with the Word of God and with Christ, and had to make that decision of who they're going to follow, God or Babylon, God or the papacy, God or Rome. That's the issue, and they know that. So, on top of that, 
what kind of spirit do these men have when they know the truth and they refuse to teach it to anyone else? Who are they actually serving? It's a testimony to me that they actually serve Satan. They don't serve God. They serve Satan. End of story, you know? And they serve Satan in the name of God. They serve Satan in the name of God. That's what angered God over Israel and Judah. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, do as I say, don't do as I do. Which is a great lead-in, gentlemen, for tomorrow's show. Um, it sounds like we're winding. It feels like we're winding down, at least. That tomorrow's show, Tom will be back, and York said he'll be back as well. And we're going to go. Uh, the name of the show is Counterfeit Bibles, and um, so we should go in more depth on, I guess, this subject matter: counterfeit Bibles and how they have changed the scriptures. They being the Jesuits and their cronies, and their minions and their blind followers through the seminary system that have changed the Bible to confuse us and to keep us from actually following the way, the truth, and the light. <laughs> so I don't know if there's any final words for either one of you gentlemen, um, uh, but I'm done. So, Well, um, the only thing that I want to, uh, want to end this broadcast is with... Um, <clears throat> The citation from Revelation 18, verse 4, as okay. Tom already did. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And I hope that this broadcast today made clear to our listeners what that really implies. What the Roman system, the Antichrist system that we are living under, even though that we are protesting it, we are not even educated enough to understand how deep we are put into that system, like Tom did uh, the explanation during the show, that we are so much born into that and then doctrinated in the so-called education system and in our churches that we visit, even as a child, that we have been brought up with a lie and that only by reading the King James Bible and certain verses like Daniel 9, like Revelation 18, we can achieve the wisdom to understand what measures we have to take to make sure of our salvation by Jesus Christ. And that means to come out of her, come out of her not only the church, but of the church and state combined system that the Roman papal system represents. That warning was given to Daniel that the fourth piece of, the, uh, uh, that the fourth piece of Revelation will be diverse from all the other beasts because it combines church and state, something all the other beasts didn't do. And we are in that. And by come out of her, it means it, come, uh, it has to come out of the civil relationship that we have with that system and it has to come out with the spiritual relationship that we have with the system. And I want to make this my closing remarks and leave the rest to Tom and uh, you, Michael, to uh, finish up. Thank you. I'll just close by pleading with the listeners, read again Daniel's prayer and understand that we are in exactly the same position that Daniel was at that time. Look at the prayer that Daniel offered. See with your own eyes of what he was repenting and do likewise. Daniel is a model for all of us. He found himself completely under the under the, the, the tyranny of the, of the beast of his day. And he knew then that it was God's judgment, God's righteous judgment. For his name's sake, may God have mercy on us. And I'll close by saying, abandon futurism. Return to historical Protestantism, the Bible, the King James Bible, and blessings in the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. We don't look for a future fulfillment. We've already got ours. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Thanks, Tom, and thanks, York. Another excellent show. Okay, folks, tomorrow, same time. Um, another show, once again, called Counterfeit Bible. 
And uh, with that, everyone have a good day. Bye-bye.